is. So today's presentation is on marketing for artists and I'm going to get really granular on the marketplace. I'm going to get really specific, give you statistics about um, different places in the marketplace and where you might fit in and uh, ways to establish a marketing routine. Um, but before I do that, I think that it is really important to be clear um, because all of the conversations going, um, going around marketing and branding for artists doesn't question uh, an assumption, which is that, um, that you are a consumable. And I don't believe that, nor is my presentation going to support that premise. Um, I believe that your voice as a creative has intrinsic value um, and it's going to differentiate you from a thousand widget makers. Um, your felt experiences, your lived experiences, your point of view is incredibly valuable precisely because it is different from a prevailing mindset that will reduce you, the human being, into a consumer and a consumable, uh, which I personally think is an obscene, um, an obscene transactional way of relating to each other and to the world. Um, so while we will look at strategies for marketing your work in, in today's presentation, I wanna make absolutely clear that you are not a can of soup Campbell's is a brand, you are a creator, and you have a persona that you present to the world with which you share your art. But you are not a can of soup, you are not a widget. Um, as an artist, when you think of branding and marketing your work, therefore always remind yourself that you are a bright star in a dark sky and not uh, one of a bazillion commodities clogging the world that is in, in a state of runaway mindless consumption. So irrespective of whether the marketplace gives a high dollar sign for what you're doing or, or a lower one, what you contribute to the world has a value. And as a creative, it is more imperative than ever that you never lose sight of that. Um, of that fact because money is not an end in and of itself. It has utilitarian value but is not a value into itself. All we have to do is look out at the broken world that greed and extractive models have created to know that this mindset is completely unsustainable and must be questioned. And who does the questioning if not artists? Who does the questioning if not the intelligentsia? Who does the questioning if not the philosophers? We have to question. So what you do as a creative, I want you to consider it a form of resistance instead of moving at a pace in which there's no time for reflection. You spend time in your studio interacting with the physical world or the digital world in a thoughtful, reflective way to create something fresh, something new, something felt something expressive of that which is human. Um, and so that action in and itself is a form of resistance and it's a way in which you can make the world more mindful, more thoughtful, more expressive, more resilient, more diverse, more beautiful. Um, and so while we look at models in which you can present your work to the world effectively and enter the marketplace effectively, that has to always be your first step. So today we're going to look at different strategies for success uh, in the visual arts market. There are more than one road to um, entering the marketplace and most artists have multiple income streams and you can enter the applied arts, which we see here on the left, and applied arts could include things like printing and publishing, landscape architecture, surface pattern design, digital electronic media, 
film and videography, photography, illustration, animation, game design, advertising, architecture, interior design, communication design, fashion design, industrial design, scientific and medical illustration, as well as tattoo artists. On the other side, we are looking at the fine arts, which has also multiple markets. Um, in art education, you can work with online subscriptions, with art stores, community centers, K through 12, college and university uh, settings. As a studio artist, you can uh, create income through grants and fellowships, sell through art galleries, sell online, freelance, get paid to be an artist in residence, uh, place your work in public places, and do commissions of all kinds. You can also work as an art therapist or as an art historian and curator, in which case you can um, get paid to be an art critic, to work at a museum or art center, to be a government collection manager, to run a commercial or nonprofit gallery, uh, to run corporate collections as an advisor or as a manager, and to work in auction houses. So I'm specifically going to think about um, fine arts because that's where I am working uh, in the college and with the Teen Ticks cohorts is with the fine arts. And I'm going to be very transparent that I have made the majority of my income since I went professional um, in 1985 in art education. In fact, I have been the primary income earner in my family, both in my first marriage and in my second marriage, um, teaching at the college and university level. But I also make money as an artist selling through art galleries. I make a substantial amount of money also in winning grants and fellowships, and I've made some money in art in public places and also through commissions. Um, but we can see here that art education offers quite a few different options to uh, generate income. A studio artist has quite a few as well. Art therapy and as an art historian and curator, and we looked at those in the last slide. So there are a number of skills that you have to develop in order to succeed in any one of these tracks. Of course, imagination and creativity is something you already have, but you also need strong communication skills. You need to be able to talk to people and to write to people. Um, and we can add to your communication skills the ability to photograph and to video as these become more and more important as we digitize and enter social media. Um, you also have to have a very strong work ethic. Entrepreneurs and creative entrepreneurs work longer hours than nine to fivers. So time management, and we will look at some time management on a granular level later in this presentation, is crucial. You have to be flexible. Again, communication, basic reading, writing, and editing skills. And you have to be able to set goals your goals should be simple, have a time frame, and be measurable. And I can't stress this enough, there is a, a lot of data uh, suggesting that people who write goals for themselves um, for the next three months, six months, year, five year, ten year, have a, a much larger chance to achieve those goals than those who don't write them down. Uh, and so I really want to encourage you to go ahead and write goals. And when you write your goals, I recommend the Aristotelian middle way. In fact, I, it's also known as the golden mean. Uh, and being a fine artist, I find the golden ratio, the golden mean, um, both in art design and in living my life, uh, really instrumental. And the Aristotelian middle way is about staying in the center of extremes. So you want to be hopeful and not fall into deficit narratives, which are easy to do. Um, or to be so, um, so dreamy 
and um, hopeful that you have impossible goals. So what you want to do is you want to be hopeful, but be realistic in your goal setting. Now, before you craft your marketing plan, you need to know your market. So let's take a look at our market. Um, before I start that marketing, I want to preamble this by saying, because I have been making my living as a teaching artist for a very long time, I have helped hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of creatives find their way to the marketplace and to success. Um, and I have done that without ever encouraging any of them to become widgets or brands. Instead, I encourage artists to dig deep and find their voice and move from that center. And so I'm just gonna play this little video very quickly to give you an idea. These are all artists who studied with me at one point and who are in contact with me on Instagram. And so I'm just gonna show you a little bit so these slides are going to show you some of their works in many parts of the country, sometimes different parts of the world. My ex-students show here in the United States. They show in Europe. They show in Saudi Arabia and in the Emirates. They sell their work through galleries. They show in nonprofit spaces. They win grants and fellowships. They get paid to be artists in residences. They sell their work directly in art fairs. Um, some of them, like Sarah there, employs other artists. I think last I heard she employed five artists. They work as illustrators, as tattoo artists, as fine artists, as surface designers, uh, as textile designers, as fashion designers. They make dolls, they make art, they make sculpture. They are art educators, all of them in their own niche, in their own place, making it happen as artists without being widgets. Start from the heart, be who you are, and offer that starlight that is inside of you and uh, proceed from there. Um, and be realistic and work hard, and that's how you're going to do it. So I said, before you make your marketing plan, you need to know your market. So let's take a look at the Saatchi report. Uh, this was published uh, earlier this year and the information was gathered um, last year. They um, interviewed uh, 500 art professionals and what they found is really interesting. So you can see that the majority of artists are not full-time visual artists. Um, so that means they are not making all of their income through the sale of their artwork. So they're cultivating different income streams. They'll sell their paintings or prints or photos or sculptures, and they'll also teach, and they'll also do public art. They'll also do some freelance work. So this is what a majority of artists are doing to make their living. And um, I categorically reject the idea that only somebody who's making their living 100% from the sale of their work is a true artist. You're an artist from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep uh, at night. Uh, and especially if you work from your center and you recognize that you bring your creativity, your point of view, and what you have to offer to the world to every interaction and to everything that you touch into the world, um, then you will have a very happy, creative life. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, like I said, they pulled 500 art professionals. Um, roughly a fourth of them were under the age of 25. Um, so from 18 to 24. More than half of those interviewed were men, even though the art world is comprised of more women than men. They interviewed more men. Nearly 20% were black, which means that BIPOCs made up the rest, which is slightly less than a quarter of those polled. And although I'm not going to answer this question for you, I want you to keep this in mind and ask these questions to yourself uh, later at the end of this presentation. Ask yourself who counts, who is contributing, 
And why should this matter to you? Why should it matter to you whose voice is being counted and who is doing the counting? So one thing we can say for sure is that the art world looks like the rest of the world. This means that uh, women are getting paid less and are getting represented less. So between 2000 and 2017, work by women artists accounted for less than 4% of total art sold at auction. And why is this important is because um, art auctions place work in um, permanent collections. And this is where the highest sales values are met in the marketplace. No women were represented in the world's top 40 highest selling artists who account for nearly half of the sales values. The data was drawn from almost the full population of a global art auction transaction for Western artists uh, for 17 years, so covering more than 1,800 auction houses, and it found that 96.1% of all artworks sold at auctions worldwide were attributed to male artists, 96.1%. And the consequence of this is that women are underrepresented in permanent collections. And uh, to the right, you can see some more data. So those of you who identify as women can have a clear-eyed view of the marketplace. Know your marketplace. It's very important. Let's continue on. A 2019 study conducted by a group of mathematicians, statisticians, and art historians at Williams College surveyed collections from 18 major U.S. museums to quantify the composition of artists in their collections. They collected data of 10,000 artist records and analyzed over 45,000 responses. And what they found was that 85.4% of the works in the collections of all major U.S. museums belong to white artists, and 87.4% are by men. So it's not your imagination. The art world is dominated by white men. There is privilege to be a white male in the art world. Now, if you don't identify as a white male, don't let this bias you against entering the art world. Because yes, this is a hurdle, but it is a hurdle that can be overcome. But you can't enter this marketplace and not face the reality. You have to know that this is not going to be a sprint this is going to be a marathon because there are structural obstacles in your way. You can be systematic and work and approach those obstacles to overcome them, but you have to know that they're there. They found that African-American artists have the lowest share with just 1.2% of artwork, of the works in their collections. Asian artists total 9%. But I want you to be cognizant of the fact that they're not making a difference between Asian American and Asian artists. So this includes artists from um, the Middle East, South Asia, Pacific Island, you know, that's in Japan, China. I mean, it's a bit Pakistan, India. It's, it's a big swath. And the same thing with when they're looking at Hispanic and Latino, they're not just looking at Latinx artists in the U.S. They're looking at all of Hispanic art and that will include Central and South America as well as the Caribbean. So we're talking about a wide collection. So something to think about and of course Native Americans are also uh, a very, very teeny, you can't even see the line where they're at, very teeny tiny percentage of that collection. So my response to this dire data is to face the realities and do it anyways, because the world needs you. The world needs your starlight. Um, 
And the person that I look to add fuel to my fire is Bell Hooks. This is a quote from um, her text, Feminist Theory from Margin to Center. And of course, she is speaking from her point of view. She is, uh, or was, she died this year. Um, she is looking at the world from the position of a black woman writer, a creative. And she says, to be in the margin is to be part of the whole, but outside the main body. Living as we did on the edge, we developed a particular way of seeing reality. We looked both from the outside in and from the inside out through incomplete, though incomplete, I was working in these statements to identify marginality as more than a site of deprivation. In fact, I was saying just the opposite, that it is also the site of radical possibility, a space of resistance. It was this marginality that I was naming as the central location for the production of a counter hegemonic discourse that is not just found in words, but in habits of being and the way one lives. As such, I was not speaking of a marginality one wishes to lose, to give up or surrender as part of moving into the center. You know, here she's talking about the center that we all are all aspiring to, that you're making it as an artist. Um, but you want to make it as an artist, not as a mindless consumer and as a mindless consumee. Rather, you want to stay in the side of marginality, clinging to it even because it nourishes one's capacity to resist. Remember, to not lose your center as you enter the marketplace and as you use a variety of strategies to market your work. And so what is it like to be a full-time artist? On the right-hand side, we see a visual that uh, is courtesy of Nicole and Amanda from Beyond the Studio Podcast. Um, and what I suggest is that we work in the Aristotelian middle way. So you neither lollygag all day, dreaming and sketching in your sketchbook, nor burn out, but rather that you manage your time and tasks mindfully with a clear eye to the obstacles and the opportunities present in the world as it is today. So don't get lost in your imagination. Do not let yourself buy into the prevailing idea that you have to be busy all the time, doing everything all the time. Busyness does not equal productivity. You have to learn to prioritize your tasks. And among those tasks should be time for reflection and for creativity. You want to work in batches, so schedule all of your marketing for one segment or one day all of your research for another, your production. Put everything into blocks to simplify and to make it easier for you to focus and to cut out distractions. Get creative in your workflow. So know yourself, know how you work. I need five, six hours at a stretch. I don't work well with 20 minutes here and an hour there. Some people need the Pomodoro technique. If you're somebody with ADHD, or who gets distracted very easily or bored every 30 minutes, then set your timer. Use the Pomodoro, 20, 25 minutes at a, at a stretch. Block yourself out in those times to work in batches. And that means that you are creating a routine and a routine automates these tasks to make it easier to follow through. You want to track your deadlines in, in a calendar and you also want to celebrate your accomplishments measure and incentivize your measurements to combat negativity bias. Negativity bias is built into the human brain. It's how we survived um, by taking a notice of where the dangers were, what was edible, what was not, where the dangerous animals were, where um, the cliff ends were so that we didn't fall off the edge. So we naturally remember things that don't work well 
versus the things that do. Um, Carol Michaels in her book, um, How to Make a Living as an Artist Without Losing Your Soul, um, is very clear that in the arts, there's the statistical um, data suggests that you get 250 odd no's for every yes. So you build this into your, um, into your routine. Tell yourself, I'm gonna go out and get 100 rejections. And when you do, you make it a celebration. That means you count each one of those rejections as, uh, as proof that you entered the field and that you entered the good fight. Instead of thinking, oh, I got rejected this many times, you say like, hey, I am resilient. I got these rejections and I'm still applying because along the way, you're going to get yeses. You're going to get wins. You're going to get your publication. You're going to get your show. You're going to get that sale. You're going to get that opportunity. So track, 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 and make time to celebrate because if not, you're going to lose heart and you'll burn out. Uh, the biggest time commitment for artists, not unsurprisingly, have to do with marketing um, of the artists that Sachi surveyed outside of creating art, social media, and website management were the two largest um, time sucks. So be very, very cognizant of these two, social media and website management. In some ways, everything is pointing for us to go social media, social media, social media, but be aware that every time you use a social media platform, you are being mined for data. You are being, you are being widgetized by Instagram, by Facebook, by TikTok, by LinkedIn, by Pinterest, by Google. They're all using your data to sell you. And, um, and they are also limiting, limiting who sees the content that you're creating. They're using the content that you're creating to draw people, but then they make you pay to have your content seen. So actually the very best place to, um, to spend your efforts is on your website. Um, and find, use this to drive, to drive traffic to this. So let's get down to business. You need to find your tribe. Um, this is a site that I have for artists of color, uh, but everybody is welcome to use it. And I have a whole bunch of interviews there as well as files and um, the, big, um, the big Excel file of opportunities. Um, for those of you who are in today's cohort, of course, Colorization Collective and Teen Ticks, and I highly recommend that you work with the cohorts in your, in your group and form a mind, um, um, and form your own group to continue after this summer. Um, so that you can uh, support each other as you continue in your creative careers. Um, you want to find your state and city granting agencies, and I have links to videos and information on all of these here. Um, and also you want to find, start looking um, either monthly or weekly at opportunities and sorting through them, seeing which ones uh, work for you. And places for fine artists to find opportunities are submittable.com, publicartist.org, c4e.com, and callforentry.org. So for a fine artist, what are your markets? Let's go over them again. Exhibitions. These can be non-gallery spaces, nonprofit spaces, community spaces, pop-ups. They can be commercial galleries, outdoor art markets and art fairs. Uh, and believe it or not, a great deal, a great deal. I know quite a few artists who make their living right here in the uh, art market and art fair space. Um, national and international art fairs through teaching, through plan air competitions, through private and corporate commissioned work and public art. And very often to get these corporate commission works, you have to go through art advisors and that's, and, um, and art reps. That's different from gallery reps. Though I've gotten commissions from gallery represent, uh, gallery representatives also. 
and then public art. Uh, and if you live in Seattle, the good news is uh, Seattle or in the Seattle area, Seattle has the second largest public art um, program in the nation. There are a lot of opportunities for both permanent and impermanent public art um, commissions in the area. Oh. All right, so one of the things that you should have gathered from Sachi's report that only 16% of people are making in the entirety of their income from the sale of their art is that you have to diversify your income stream. And here we can see a breakdown of all of the different ways in which artists are making um, their living. My friend Pablo makes the majority of his income two or I think two or three times a year. And these are linked to holidays. He throws a studio art party and he sells his work. Um, and that's all he does. He sells his work. He, he lives from his art. So um, look at these all as potentials, ways for you to reach different audiences. Don't just think of it as transactional as, oh, I'm making a sale here or there. Think of it as ways in which you are contributing to different segments of the marketplace. Um, so let's talk about your basic kit, which should be online. Uh, because everything is happening online. Uh, so you want to build your online portfolio and you want to do that by using a layout and template. And I suggest you start with free subscriptions. Some free subscriptions that are available are Wix. They also have paid, they also have paid uh, layouts, but start with the free ones. Wix, WordPress, Squarespace, Weebly, Network Solutions are some of the ones that I have seen being used very effectively. And I have a site on WordPress and another on Weebly and I manage my own. So, and I am a tech idiot. So if I can do it, you can do it. Um, to sell from your website, you have to curate it and keep it clean and keep it current. And you have to have prices and have a way for people to buy. My website, you, when you go to my website, you're not gonna find that because I'm a visual Jungian. <laughs> I see my website as an archive where my lab experiments um, are open to the public and are able to be seen, uh, but it is not a site for selling. If you're using your website as part of your online presence to sell your work, you have to curate. You can't have everything that you ever made there right? You can't use it as an archive. Be very clear on what your goals are for your website. Um, ace your artist statement and your about me page. And remember that an artist statement was not written by the finger of some divinity on stone. It is a living, breathing document, which you can change anytime, every time, um, as your focus in your work shifts and changes. Um, Instagram is the most popular when it comes to influencer marketing, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for your brand, for your art practice. The largest portion of Instagram users are aged between 25 and 34 year olds. So if your marketing, if your audience is younger, TikTok, which has 689 million users, is more likely to be uh, a usable uh, platform for you and a better place for you to focus your online presence. Uh, so ask yourself, who is your target audience? For writers, Twitter, uh, for visual artists, Instagram, younger artists, TikTok, and LinkedIn um, is also a place specifically a great place to make connections to other professionals in the field. Um, um, your website and email list are your best assets. So a reminder that you don't own the content that you post on any social media website. They own your content, they use your data, 
then they change their algorithms at will and means that you don't control who sees your content unless you're paying to play. All right, pay to play um, is very real. I know a lot of creatives who had huge followings and when they changed their algorithms, they lost, um, they're only getting a fraction of the traction they used to get unless they start paying for ads. So this is to say that your website and your email list are yours. So drive traffic to your website from these platforms so that you can collect email addresses for direct contact and control what people see. Email marketing is 40 times more effective than Facebook and Twitter, according to statistics. And how you do email marketing is using uh, newsletter and email platforms. Some tools would be HubSpot, MailChimp, Pipedrive, Constant, Contact, and GoDaddy. I personally have a hate relationship with GoDaddy. One of these days I'm breaking up with GoDaddy. I don't know when, but it's gonna happen and I currently use MailChimp. Um, but these are just some of the platform tools that are available for your direct marketing. Um, so this cheat sheet for art marketing tasks come from Allison Stanfield, author of I'd Rather Be In The Studio. It's a book that I have in my, in my office and it's a book that I ordered for the library stacks at the college and I highly recommend it along with a number of other books, including, as I mentioned already, um, I included um, Carol Michaels, uh, How to, uh, Being an Artist, Surviving as an Artist Without Losing Your Soul. Um, but there are other really great books, including Artspire, The Profitable Artist, uh, published by um, uh, NIFA, and Jackie Battenfield's book is also uh, really invaluable and Jackie Battenfield is not only an amazing artist in her own right but she runs the Artists in the Marketplace program at the um, Bronx Museum. I was a part of that program and so I know for a fact uh, and having read the book that all of the material in that textbook is invaluable to you as an artist. But let's look at these daily marketing tasks. Notice that number one here is spend time in the studio, connect with your work, because without it, there's no reason to have a marketing schedule, right? Read something about art or about the business of art for motivation and inspiration. Then you can go ahead and post an image or video to social media. I no longer go on social media on a daily basis. I use an app and with very rare exceptions, just stories. I literally schedule everything several weeks ahead of time. I use Business Suite, which bundles Facebook and Instagram. I do all my stories, my posts and photos on there look at the feedback on who sees more of your work at what time, and I schedule it for those times, so I batch it all in one sitting and I don't have to go back in on a daily basis. And I recommend that you find a system that works for you for doing that, because you saw that social media management was the largest portion, so learning to um, prioritize your time is going to be crucial Learn how to use social media, not how to let social media use you. Um, if you're running a Pinterest board, add a pin. Pinterest is the third most powerful search engine online. So don't forget the description. I haven't used Pinterest at all. Uh, I started early just posting stuff and then lost complete interest. Uh, because every time I go on there, it's like going down the rabbit hole and then it's using me and not me using it. So I just stay clear. But you might be able to use it effectively. Um, on a daily basis, spend five to ten minutes commenting on other social media accounts. Don't be a withholder. Give hearts, man. 
give hearts and comments to people. Um, don't be stingy. It takes very little. It takes very little to just click and give a heart. Um, I actually find people that I see are looking at my stuff and, and don't give hearts. I think of them as withholders. And, you know, I put a little question mark in my own mind over them. Like, if they're this stingy on something that takes nothing, what are they like in real life? Mm, mm, mm. Um, make a note on what you accomplished during the day. This is, again, celebrating and um, measuring um, because this is very important. It'll help you um, be alert to when you're starting to burn out. Um, and it will help to build your resilience, especially if you write down the things that went right during the day. Uh, and that brings me to the last one here, which is write your gratitudes. Um, this is coming right out of positive psychology. Um, very important. I, I've been keeping a gratitude practice for, I don't know, maybe a decade. Every day, every single day, I write down at least three things for which I am grateful. And sometimes those three things are very simple, like it was cold and I had hot tea. And sometimes it goes on for a whole page. Um, so anything, anything that you are grateful for goes in there. It's very, very good for you. And remember, if you're going to get 250 no's for every yes, and you're looking at a bunch of obstacles because only some are given open entry through the front door of the art auctions and the art museums and the top tier galleries, then this right here is absolutely necessary. As necessary as brushing your teeth, as necessary as feeding and housing yourself. This is the only way you're going to be able to persist with your creativity in the long haul without falling prey to depression, despondency, substance abuse, and so on. All right, your weekly art marketing tasks. Post an article or an image of your art to your blog. Check in a couple of times with your online community. Make these connections that are real, not just transactional, um, is my recommendation. Send a few personal emails, notes, or thank you cards. Make or post a new video or do a story or live stream. Find some new people on social media to connect with. Work a little on your newsletter ideas and review your week. And I'm, I'm taking a moment here to show you Juan Alonso's Instagram. Juan Alonso is a self-taught artist. He is an incredibly successful public artist and independent artist. When I first met Juan, uh, he was at Francine Setter's gallery, the oldest gallery in the city. And when she retired and closed, he started representing himself. And he has been making a living solely from his art since. So look at this beautiful, highly curated, beautifully photographed Instagram um, site for inspiration. Um, your monthly art marketing tasks. Make a date for yourself to revisit old content and content ideas folders. You can repost or rework something. Um, Send a newsletter or a simple message to your entire email list. Go to an art function or event in person where you can meet new people and connect with old friends. Update your list with names of people who want to receive your email and review your income goals to see if you're on track. Um, quarterly marketing tasks include sending out postcards to everyone you want to keep your name in front of. Um, check in with your gallerists to see how they're doing. This is really important because not all you, the galleries that will represent and sell your work will pay you in a timely way. Sometimes you need to call them 
and show up and go like, hey, hey, hey how's my work? Um, to get paid. So um, also keeping yourself in front of their face will help them sell more of your art. Because again, it's about connections. It's not just about transactional. Um, if you don't check in with them, then they're, you're just using them as a depository, as a storefront. Um, and where is the motivation for them if they have no connection with you other than with you as a widget? Um, they'll have no motivation to sell your work. Update images and text on your website, your art inventory records if you don't do it more frequently, and review your plans and goals and then on a yearly basis, review your income goals. When you're starting out, your income goal might just be to, this year I'm going to sell X number of pieces. If you've never sold a single piece, then I'm gonna sell three pieces this year. So again, you don't have to say, this year I'm going to make $100,000 from my art. Dude, if you do, wonderful. And if you don't, well, you know, that was a pretty impossible. If you're starting at zero, that's a pretty impossible goal. So again, occupy that Aristotelian um, middle way. Be optimistic, be hopeful, but also be realistic. Walk the middle way, set realistic but challenging goals for yourself for the year, and then comb through your entire website to see that content is fresh, that the design looks current, that you don't have broken links, and so on. So we've looked at very specific ideas about um, the art market and about um, how to work from your center, what sites work for you, and what your basic kit is for your online presence, how to leverage your website and email list as, a, as your asset, and then these um, marketing tasks are coming to you from Allison Stanfield, and I stand by these marketing tasks. They're very useful. And because so many of um, my of my audience are students and art students, I want to just the last minute or two of this presentation talk about the costs of an art degree versus art income um, because the majority of artists making their living as artists these days are not people with BFAs and MFAs and I want to stress the fact that you don't have to have a BFA or an MFA to enter the marketplace and succeed. An MFA is necessary if you're going to teach in college or university. And it is not necessary though, it is highly uh, useful if you're trying to break into a higher tier gallery because it adds a certain level of credibility and more importantly it adds a theoretical and vocabulary um, baseline from which to approach um, the dialogue with this segment of the marketplace but it is not necessary uh, and you need to think very carefully about um, what it costs to get an art degree and what kind of salary you're going to make as a creative. Um, so here, for example, is just a sample of some of the best fine art schools. Um, Yale occupying that, that coveted one, you know, first place. And you're talking about a cost of $60,000 a year. Um, they're not the most expensive. Uh, Columbia uh, in New York is more expensive. Um, but you're going to see that your city colleges and universities are going to be cheaper if you're in-state. 
Um, so here in Seattle, that would be UW. Um, and your tuition will be lower than for outer state. Um, but that's not the only cost that you have to think about. Um, so look at, you don't want to, my, <laughs> my recommendation is not to walk out of art school with, uh, you know, a hundred thousand dollar debt on your back. Cause that's like a freaking mortgage. Uh, and you still have to pay for rent and for food after you get out of school. So if you're also paying your, um, student loan like a mortgage then you know you you're pretty much going to be poor um, and again i am not advocating that you make yourself into a widget into a consumable and sell your soul um, but i i do advocate that you occupy a middle space that you um, are practical about how you generate income for yourself and for your family uh, and for your art practice and get recompense. So um, think about some of the art jobs will make more money than others. So a 3D technical artist, um, annual salary average is 101,000. Remote game artist, 96,000. And that is very, very different from a fine artist um, which has an average salary of 40,000. So um, you, if you're making an annual salary of $40,000 um, doing your various art jobs, uh, you don't necessarily want, it's not a good payoff for your investment to walk out of art school with you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt so keep that in mind and then my my last slide here is one last call to have you consider that money is not the end objective money is good but destiny is greater and this is a quote from Oliver Ellison who is an Icelandic artist speaking at the World Economic Forum. And he says, one of the great challenges today is that we often feel untouched by the problems of others and by global issues like climate change. Even though we could easily do something to help, we do not feel strongly enough that we are part of a global community, part of a larger we. Giving people access to data most often leaves them feeling overwhelmed and disconnected, not empowered and poised for action. This is where art can make a difference. Art does not show people what to do, yet engaging with a good work of art can connect you to your sense, your body, your mind. It can make the world felt and felt feeling spurs thinking, engagement, and even 